Now, first up, we have to talk about her music theft. It's no secret that Jennifer Lopez has been accused of stealing or borrowing background tracks and vocals from other artists for years. Now, one of the stars who accused her of doing this was Usher in 2005. He claimed that she stole a song that he cast aside while recording his hugely successful album called Confessions. Usher claimed that JLo's single Get Right is actually a re recorded version of Ride, a song that he co wrote the year before, which was only available online. He said, quote, I hate it, but I'd better be getting some of the publishing rights or else. I didn't put it on my album because I couldn't get it right, but I didn't expect JLo to just take it. And apart from being accused of stealing the same sample song that Mariah Carey used for Loverboy, JLo was also given songs that were initially intended for a shanty. Which is why a lot of people claim what happened between the two artists was straight up music theft. In September 2001, Lopez released I'm Real from her second studio. Album, J Lo, that she worked with Iv Gotti. But the song was already recorded and mixed with Ashanti's vocals, which is why you still hear her in the background vocals in Lopez's version. Moving on to the embarrassing feud with her makeup artist. Scott Barnes, who's worked for JLo for the last 20 years, has had to deal with so much of her crazy hot and cold behavior. In the mid 2000s, she essentially banished him after rumors surfaced that someone had leaked info to the press about her and Mark Anthony's secret marriage ceremony. Speaking on the Jeff Probst show in 2012, and when asked about how JLo treated him, Scott said, It was like I had the plague. Interesting enough, eventually she ended up giving him his old job back after learning the truth, but apparently failed to apologize for being so cold and ruthless towards him. I mean, she literally cut him off without a word and blamed him for the leak without even confronting him. Barnes went on to say, I went right back to work with her and we never spoke about it again, which is even weirder. Now, the funny thing is, her celebrity makeup artist would go on to work with her for another six years and insisted that they remained on good terms, despite the fact that she ghosted him and didn't even apologize. Next, we have sharing the stage. J Lo didn't hold back when it came to her opinion on sharing the stage with Shakira at the 2020 Super Bowl halftime show. In her newly released documentary called Halftime, she labeled it as the worst idea in the world. If I was going to be a double headliner, they should have given us 20 minutes, that's what they should have effing done, she said. Basically, it turns out that Jennifer was frustrated with the FNL for booking two headliners and making them share the same amount of time that any solo performer would receive, as opposed to doubling it and giving the women extra extra time to shine. As a result, fans slammed the artist for coming off as entitled. While it's true that they only gave the performers 6 minutes each, the action packed show garnered immense praise from fans across the globe, with many fans commending the woman for showcasing their Latin heritage so brilliantly. What JLo was really mad about though is that previous solo headliners like Beyonce and The Weeknd received 14 minutes to perform. But judging by her complaints, it's clear that she feels offended that they even asked her to share the stage at all. Next, we have the cheating allegations. Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck have had an on and off again romance that has been going on since the 2000s, with fans even nicknaming the couple Benifer. Now, I mean, these two just got married after they first got engaged nearly two decades ago. But the timeline of their relationship is a huge red flag and include alleged cheating. So, in July of 2022, Lopez filed for divorce from her second husband, Chris Judd, citing irreconcilable differences. But this news broke just months after Lopez had wrapped the movie Jilji along her then boyfriend, Ben. Even though she vehemently denied cheating rumors, Ben took out an ad in The Hollywood Reporter gushing about Lopez before her divorce wasn't yet finalized. In fact, even Chris Judd's father, Larry, spoke out against the couple and accusing JLo of being unfaithful to his son. He insinuated that the affair started during the filming of GLG. Quote, I thought Mr. Affleck would honor a married woman and not just go right into the trailer, and added that she'd be happier if she'd just tell the truth, and no one in her little circle is going to say one negative thing about her. But we'll never really know the truth of what happened. Now, this brings us to our next point the Mark Anthony romance. 
Celebrity gossip magazines could not get enough of the power couple in the early 2000s. They were absolutely everywhere, and it seems like fans love the pairing. But their beginnings as a couple were super questionable to say the least. Anthony married former Miss Universe Dana Nera Torres in 2000 while Lopez was dating Ben Affleck around the same time. But the on again, off again couple picked their romance back up when Anthony was still married to Dayanara. So, less than a week after Anthony's divorce was finalized, the couple surprised fans by getting married in a small, casual ceremony in her Beverly Hills home in early June. It really begs the question of whether or not JLo was some kind of homewrecker because the timeline of the rekindled relationship seems really off. I mean, he actually broke Dana Era's heart as she said, You go through hell. I cried until there were no tears left, until I was numb. I didn't want to eat. I didn't care to get dressed or take a shower. I just wanted to lie there. Now, Anthony's feelings for Jennifer might have been there all along because the two had a history, but he should have put more thought into who he chose to marry in the first place. So, in a way, they're both at fault. And now, let's talk about the insensitive comments. So, to give some background on why everyone felt that JLo was trashing belly dancing. A part of the 2020 Super Bowl performance featured young dancers sitting in glowing cages, which many people assumed represent the immigrant children in cages at the US border. But JLo apparently had a hard time convincing the NFL to do this and said, I'm trying to give you something with substance, not just us out there shaking our effing asses and effing belly dancing. She went on to say that she wanted something real, something that's going to make a statement, something that's going to say we belong here and we have something to offer. Now, if you're confused as to why this was controversial, it's essentially because she compared the art of belly dancing to just shaking your butt for the hell of it. In fact, that particular line was shared across Twitter and people were big mad. It was just a little culturally insensitive to say, considering that the dance has long been associated with Middle Eastern cultures and that's something that Shakira has become known for, using it to channel her father's Lebanese Syrian Arab roots. Next up we have avoiding the Bronx. This one train wreck of an ad campaign led to people openly mocking both Chrysler and Jennifer Lopez. Now, the central premise of the ad was that sometimes Julo will drive through her old hood in the South Bronx in a Fiat 500 just to stay inspired. Although it sounds ridiculous, the marketing campaign obviously tried to draw on the singer's famous Jenny from the Block era. Most people recognize the song, in which she pays tribute to growing up in the Bronx, which has been a solid part of her image since the 90s. In fact, the singer even titled her debut album on the 6, which is a clear reference to the New York subway train. Now, a press release at the time stated that she'd be traveling through the streets of Manhattan to the Bronx where she grew up. But the ad backfired when the smoking gun reported that Lopez never actually went to the Bronx to film the ad and that a body double stand in and was used instead, calling it, quote, it is such a breathtaking assemblage of hoary urban cliches, and that was putting it lightly. Next, we have the movie line interview. The infamous movie line interview in 1998 that could have almost ruined J Lo's career was truly worse than you can imagine. She was 27 at the time and fresh off the success of her film Selena. Now, she basically decided to trash all other celebrities that were big at the time and try to trivialize their career and contribution to the industry. In fact, when asked about Madonna, she actually said, Do I think she's a great performer? Yeah. Do I think she's a great actress? No. Acting is what I do, so I'm harder on people and they say, Oh, I can do that, I can act. I'm like, Hey, don't spit on my craft. Now, this is so ironic because JLo would go on to do both music and acting for the rest of her career, and critics also trashed her acting on the big screen. Also, at the time, Madonna had been a star for longer than JLo, so there was really no comparison there. And when Gwyneth Paltrow was brought up, Jennifer almost seemed to laugh and made it clear that she didn't take her fellow actress's career seriously, saying, Tell me what she's been in, I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in. Some people get hot by association. I heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I ever heard about her work. Yikes. Moving on to the accusations of racism. 20 years ago, Lopez was approaching a full actualization as an entertainer, but a single from her second album, J Lo, almost derailed her career entirely. The Murder Inc. remix of I'm Real, which features Ja Rule and owned the radio in 2001, was ruined by the N word she drops in her final verse. Now, the issue was that the song was an instant hit, so much that 10 years later in 2011, Billboard gave it the sixth spot on its 40 biggest debuts of all time. List. But rightfully, 
rightfully so, people were outraged by her use of the loaded term. Not only because she's a Latina artist, but at her level of success where she has a platform and sets an example to young fans, using such a derogatory word is at best offensive. But as the accusations of racism started to mount against the star, she eventually spoke out to defend her actions on the Today Show. For anyone to think or suggest that I'm racist is really absurd and hateful to me. Although many people think this is not an excuse, it was later revealed that the track was actually written by J. Rule himself and he encouraged her to say it. And lastly, we need to talk about the awful reasons she had a maid fired. Now this one is really indefensible. Jennifer Lopez allegedly got a German hotel maid fired for asking for an autograph. Prey Dojo was a staff member at the luxury Melia Hotel in Dusseldorf, Germany during Lopez's stay in 2012. She was a big fan of JLo and worked at the Courage to knock on the star's hotel door to ask for an autograph and was promptly turned away. Prey claims that she was relieved from her post the day after the incident. She told The Sun, I am an incredibly big fan, so I took all of my courage and rang the doorbell to get an autograph, but I was rejected by two assistants at the door. A day later, the cleaning company that employed me at the hotel called and said that Miss Lopez had complained. I was fired right there on the phone. If the incident really happened, it's hard to ignore the irony when you remember that Jennifer played a hotel maid in the movie Made in Manhattan. Now, after receiving a rightful amount of backlash, the pop star wrote on Twitter, Come on, thought you knew me better than this. Would never get anyone fired over an autograph. First I've heard of this was on Twitter. Hashtag hurtful. If the foundations of your success can be attributed to the chairman of Sony Music using you to piss off his ex wife, one could say you may not have earned your place in the industry, aka JLo's sabotage startup. For those out of the loop, Mariah Carey is the ex-wife of former Sony chairman Tommy Antola, and they had a contentious divorce, during which JLo was a rookie newly signed to the label. She was young, she was pretty, and she was absolutely desperate, so Matola used JLo as his pawn against Mariah. Matola tried to sabotage Carey's glitter soundtrack, and to quote Mariah herself after hearing my new song, using the same sample I used, Sony rushed to make a single for another female entertainer on their label, whom I don't know. A reference, of course, to the famous quote Mariah had made about JLo years prior. Carrie knows that she got the last laugh, however, to quote all of that. Loverboy ended up being the best selling single of 2001 in the United States. Matola, however, did find success in damaging Mariah's career and exasperating JLo's in the process. By feeding her successful samples and lyrics for her to repurpose, it worked so well that JLo just kept stealing from other artists. It's part of the reason she's so hated. She profited heavily off of black underground artists, either by literally using their vocals or by taking and rewriting their songs with slightly differing lyrics. Said artists were shy. Ashante Moore, Christina Millian, Usher, Mariah Carey, and of course Ashante, the biggest victim of JLo's music theft. She stole from all of those artists and more, and sometimes not even just once. Her history of profiting off of black artists and music is well known and extremely problematic. In fact, it got so bad, artists would start leaking their own music so JLo couldn't steal it. No artist wants to work with someone who can only be titled an artist themselves because they steal from others, especially if they're massively egotistical about it. Because JLo, in her mind, is a master craft. She's the world's best dancer. She's the world's best actress and singer and performer. Having confidence is one thing, but being self obsessed is another. Back in 2021, a string of articles came out about how the self glorifying JLo actually burnt bridges with celebrity acquaintances with her behavior. To quote, everyone in JLo's life has to accept it's about her pretty much all of the time, or they simply won't be tolerated in the first place, spilt an insider to the globe. But lately, it's gotten boring for the likely of Lee Remini, Beyonce and Jay-Z, Demi Lovato, Gwyneth Paltrow, and others because of her non-stop me, me, me conversations. The source, an alleged fired house staffer, also added that JLo is standoffish and cool and never asks others what they're doing and isn't interested to know. She won't even hug them for fear, it'll spoil her makeup. Yet there's having confidence. Then there's having arrogance, as Jennifer Lopez has walked a dangerous tightrope between the two for literal years. Traditionally, you know, it's the people, it's Hollywood their press, the movie going public, that determines who is an A-list star. Not the star themselves, but during her literally renowned, famous 1998 movie line interview, J-Lo yeeted tradition and declared herself an A-list star. When movie line asked Lopez why she believed she was hot in Hollywood at the time, she responded candidly with, because I'm the best 
and I feel I can do anything. Because I'm the best, having too much belief in your own abilities inevitably gets under the skin of colleagues and viewers alike. Lopez even then went on to claim that she had something called the stardom glow, but not everyone saw it that way. Sure, 1998 was a good year for her, veteran film critic Roger Albert even praising JLo for the Selena biopic, but praises like that went right to Lopez's head before she fell off in 2003. Despite that, JLo ultimately isn't a horrific actress, but she isn't a great one either. So how does she still land roles evidently not made for her? Flirty fishing. You always flirt with your co-stars. It's harmless, Lopez told Movie Line in 1998. And it's uh, most definitely not, especially if that workplace is a movie set and millions of dollars are at stake. Directors are gonna get nervous about their actors flirting. So how does JLo then deal with that? She flirts with them too. To quote her, that's the best way to deal with these big wigs, she said to Movie Line when they asked about her relationship with the U-turn director, Oliver Stone. I just went in there and we hit it off and I I flirted with him, got tough with him, and he just loved it. Now can you imagine if the roles was reversed and a man who had just said that quote was saying it about female co-stars and directors. Let's hold women accountable for using their sexuality to also pressure and discomfort others into giving them what they want, shall we? That's not cool, JLo. And speaking of not cool, if she ain't flirting with the male co-stars, she's victimizing the starlets. JLo has a mean streak and competitive side. Pair that with ego and self-pedestalization, it makes sense she'd say such things as tell me what she's been in about Gwyneth Paltrow in 1998, months before Paltrow would literally win the Best Actress Award. And she also tacked on some people get hot by association. I heard more about Gwen and Brad than I ever heard about her work. These quotes were pulled from the famous 1998 movie line interview after she was asked what she thought of actresses she was competing with for roles. She then went on to say Romeo and Juliet star Claire Danes does the same thing with every character and that she was never a big fan of two time Oscar nominee Winona Ryder. What did she think of Cameron Diaz? A lucky model who's been given a lot of opportunities. I just wish she would have done more with them. And when talking about Madonna and the insane success of 1996's Evita, she scoffs and shares her opinion of the literal queen of pop. Do I think she's a great actress? No. Acting's what I do. So I'm harder on people when they say, oh, I can do that. I can act. I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. Your craft, J-Lo, bit of a stretch for someone who bit the hand that better. And I'm talking about Rosie Perez, because J-Lo wouldn't have a career without her. Perez was the choreographer at an open casting call for In Living Color in 1991. While the show's creator called J-Lo a chubby and corny looking girl, Rosie saw potential in her dancing and was adamant they gave her a chance. But then writes in her autobiography that soon all of the girls are coming into my office complaining about how J-Lo was manipulating wardrobe, makeup, and me all to her advantage. Perez then added when she confronted Lopez, she reacted like, quote, some ghetto biatch, screaming and pounding her chest and yelling at Perez, I know I'm good, I'm better than any of these girls and you know it. Lopez leaves In Living Color just to, after two seasons, but once she makes it big in Hollywood, she went on a smear campaign and making disparaging comments about Perez, who she owes her career to. Stories like this make it obvious that JLo treats people pretty poorly, which means that her staff has it tough. Be prepared to be on call 24-7 to carry her to her every women need. And in Unless you are one or two of the staff who are very senior, don't even expect her to acknowledge you. One staff member said it was like working for a ghost. In 2022, amid a TikTok storm of fans sharing negative encounters with Lopez, TikTok user Kyla shares how her father worked for a driving company and he refused to drive for JLo after learning what the rules are for it. She doesn't allow the drivers to look at her or talk to her. They're not allowed to let her luggage touch the ground and even if the driver looks in the rear view min window, they could be subjected to a scolding. That's believable since a woman on Quora, Emily Watford, shared her experience working at a concert arena and literally watching a doorman get fired for making eye contact with JLo. According to Today Mag, JLo requires her nannies to work grueling hours every day of the week. Quote, normally people who have huge sums of money and have loads of professional and social obligations hire a nanny for each child, especially newborns. But it's as if Jennifer expects one nanny to not only take care of both twins, but to work 16 hour days, seven days a week, as told to the National Enquirer. Really, just pity anyone, like a maid or an airline attendant that comes within her orbit. I mean, she's going to ignore you as rudely as possible. Take the United Airlines first class air, uh, attendant who merely asked JLo what she would like to drink. To quote him, Jennifer refused to even acknowledge me. She turned her head away and told her personal assistant, please tell him I'd like a Diet Coke with and lime. It gets a lot worse when you talk about the German hotel maid who dared to knock on her door and politely asked for an autograph. Named Pre Dodage, she said it took all 
of my courage and I rang the bell to get an autograph, but I was rejected by two assistants at the door. A day later, the cleaning company that employed me called and said Miss Lopez has complained and I was fired right there on the phone. Lopez then turned around and called the story hurtful and refuted she got anyone fired, but she didn't deny making the call. Anyways, I'd be mortified by something like that myself, but that's honestly J-Lo for you. That's how she treats people. She's completely shameless. This is a woman who will fire you for looking at her and has no concept of why that's not okay. A woman on TikTok, Julia Wang, shared her story of meeting one of J-Lo's backup dancers in Vegas concert where J-Lo was performing and shared how cruelly they were treated, saying if you were pretty or if you were Latina, it was like a game over. She hated you. Oh, J-Lo, not being a girl's girl. Uh, please, we've had that established since the bash of 1998. Wang further went and claimed that J-Lo refused to talk or even look at the backups during their many hours of rehearsal time, except for the occasional eye roll or scoff, and that the only time her demeanor does a 180 is when that man walk into the room. She only treats women poorly because she views them as competition, which, as a woman, is the deadliest seven sins of girl codes. First off, we see Ben talk about how he felt exposed after Jennifer shared a private book of their emails and letters. 20 years ago, I fell in love with the love of my life, and during that time, I was making an album called This Is Me Then. Lopez is heard telling a crowd in the documentary. I hadn't made an album since then. Years later, we got back together and I was very inspired. The inspiration came after her quote Bible she calls it, which was the book Affleck gave her on their first Christmas together. It is every letter and every email that we wrote to each other from 20 years ago to today, she says, sharing that he titled the quote Bible, The Greatest Love Story Never Told by Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck, 2001 to 2021 and counting. Lopez placed the book in the studio and let her collaborators go through it for song inspiration. To Ben's surprise, Ben appears shocked and surprised to find out that Lopez shared this private book he gave her with everyone in the studio. When talking to the artist working with Jennifer Lopez, Affleck discovers that they gave him a nickname. I was like, you've been showing all the musicians these letters, Affleck says in the documentary, and they were like, yeah, we call you Pen Affleck. And I was like, oh my god. In the documentary, we also learned that Ben had some serious reservations of his love story being shared so publicly. I did really find the beauty and the poetry and the irony in the fact that it's the greatest love story never told, he tells the cameras. And if you're making a record about it, that seems kind of like you're telling it. In another scene, Affleck expresses how it was an adjustment for him to have her share their private life with the entire world. Jen was really inspired by this experience, which is how artists do their work, he says. I certainly do the same things, but things that are private, I have always felt are sacred and special because, in part, they're private. So this was something of an adjustment for me. Ultimately, Ben comes to terms with Lopez's project after realizing it's not all about their relationship. I don't really love being in the making of a documentary about my personal life, which is why I'm so relieved that I'm not really, well, it seems like I might be in this, but I'm not really. He he says, I was worrying for no reason. The movie wasn't about me. It was about the ability to love yourself, and that love story is a lot effing harder to find than Prince Charming. Next, we learned Ben had to make compromises when they got back together. Getting back together, I said, listen, one of the things I don't want is a relationship on social media, Ben says. Then I sort of realized it's not a fair thing to ask her. It's sort of like, you're gonna marry a boat captain, and you're like, well, I don't like the water. He added, We're just two people with kind of different approaches trying to learn to compromise. Next, we learned in the documentary that some A-list stars declined to be in the movie musical about her life that accompanies the documentary. In the documentary, Lopez reveals Anthony Ramos, the In the Heights star, was offered the role of her significant other in the rebound scene of the movie. The movie. He was going to do the rebound number with me and the glass house, she tells wardrobe supervisor Sean Barton during rehearsals, and he was like, uh, I'm friends with Mark Anthony. Lopez was married to Mark Anthony from 2000 to 2014, and the pair share 16-year-old twins. The rebound scene that Anthony was supposed to be in shows Lopez in a toxic relationship with a drunken partner. The singer, however, never specifically mentions who the song and scene is about. We also see Jennifer crying about a past relationship and how it negatively impacted her self-esteem. She gets emotional as she recalls a relationship in which she says she was, quote, manhandled before she hit rock bottom and realized it was time to get out. 
out. Though she doesn't name the ex, singer and actress speaks candidly through tears about the experience and how it affected her going forward. Being thrown around and manhandled is not fun, she explains. I was never in a relationship where I got beat up, thank God, but I've definitely been manhandled in a couple of other unsavory things. Jen doesn't reveal who treated her that way, but her long career in showbiz has involved plenty of high profile relationship in addition to her marriage now to Ben Affleck. Jennifer shares more about her past toxic relationships by saying, quote, there were people in my life who said I loved you and then didn't do things that were kind of in line with the word love. You have to hit rock bottom where you're in situations that are so uncomfortable and so painful that you finally go, I don't want this anymore. A therapist said to me, what if this was your daughter? What would you do? And it was so clear, she called. I was like, I'd tell her, get out of there and never look back. But for me, it was so clouded and so complicated with so much of my past and my own pain and hurt and dysfunction that I couldn't see clearly. It was like looking through fog. Jane Fonda had some honest words with Jennifer in the documentary while on a phone call with her. I want you to know that I don't entirely know why, but I feel invested in you and Ben, and I really, really, really want this to work, tells Jen of Ben Affleck on a call filmed for the documentary. However, this is my concern. Like, it feels too much like you're trying to prove something instead of just living it. You know, either every other photograph is kissing and the two of you hugging. Jennifer shrugs it off and laughs, though. That's just us living our life, says. But Jane Fonda did have a point, and if Jennifer listened to her, it may have saved her from receiving horrendous reviews online after the after both movies came out. After both movies came out. Some saying the movie musical is the worst movie ever made. One reviewer made a list called The Reasons Why This Sucked. I had no idea what was going on in the movie. There was no theme. Actually, there were too many themes. There were so many talented artists who were used more as props. They should have had bigger roles. This movie seems like an ode to herself for nailing down a man. It's not really about love. It's a movie about conquering a man. It's basically telling everybody that other relationships that her and Ben had were just filler until they could be together again. Her kids and Ben's kids are going to be watching this. Do they really need to know how much she loves making love to her to their dad? We all know it's not her voice singing those songs, and if it is, auto-tune should get a lot of credit, the reviewer says. The reviewer finishes off by saying she's narcissistic, way too in love with herself, and for people clicking more than two stars, did you actually watch it? Or are you just clicking on five stars because you love this ego maniac? Thoughts in the documentary on former co-star Jane Fonda's phone call saying, Jane is still very protective of her and felt like you're putting yourself out there to get beat up again. Jane Fonda's concerns resurfaced when she thinks about photos of the couple at the Grammy Awards in which Ben Affleck's disinterested expression became the target of memes galore and gossips about and gossip about Jen and gossip about the pair's relationship. I get real scared, you know, with all that about the Grammys and he looks unhappy and I'm like, oh my god, what's happening? Fonda told Jennifer, nothing. Fly. Jennifer Lopez also revealed she got multiple no thank yous from more fellow celebs that she hoped would appear with her in the movie. Taylor Swift, whom Jennifer joined on stage during Taylor's Red Tour 2013, declined, according to Today.com. Jason Momoa, Jennifer Coolidge, Lizzo, Vanessa Hudgens, Ariana Grande, and Snoop Dogg also allegedly declined. Khloe Kardashian was another potential celebrity cameo who dropped out. I don't want to force anybody to this who go, it's gonna be fine, for says in the film. Nobody wants to say no to me, Benny. I get that, she tells her manager, Benny Medina. But when an actor doesn't like a script good enough or is worried about it, that is what they'll say. Jennifer, who ultimately put $20 million of her own money in visual album, also admits in the film that the whole project made her nervous too. People are scared, scared to put out there. I get it, she says. Took me a long time. I'm scared. I don't act like I'm scared. That's the secret to my whole effing career. Looking back on her childhood, Lopez also reveals that she felt very ignored by her dad and that her mother was always the center of attention. She got used to being around people who acted that way. Jen felt emotionally neglected as a child, Ben Affleck says. He continues drawing parallels with her longing for approval and his own past struggles with alcoholism. It's a hard thing to look at somebody whose professional life is wildly successful and who on Instagram looks like they're living the happiest life in the world. The thing you discover is there isn't enough alcohol in all the liquor stores in the world to fill up that thing. In Jennifer's case, I don't think there's enough followers or movies or records or any of that stuff. Part of you still feels a longing and
campaign. Ultimately, that's the work that you gotta do on your own. Once a couple 20 years ago, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez are now back together and fans are. Ben is reportedly angry with Jennifer currently after her new movie about their love life was recently released. Insiders told The Heat that Affleck was reportedly scared that JLo's new film, This Is Me Now, would ruin his career and apparently that fear has not dissipated. There is a very real risk that this film will not get the reaction she is expecting. Ben's been complaining to friends this could end up being Jiggly 2.0 they said it will be especially embarrassing for him considering the career that he has built up and how seriously he takes his projects. He is scared he's made a big mistake getting involved. This is the second project they've worked on together and since Jiggly was so panned by critics receiving a 6% on Rotten Tomatoes and losing over 60 million dollars at the box office it seems as though Affleck has been worried about the same treatment and it allegedly caused problems in their marriage. Ben Affleck also recently admitted the romance forced him to make major compromises. Jennifer was really inspired by this experience, which is how artists do their work, Affleck said. They get inspired by their personal life. It moves you. I know as a writer and director, I certainly do the same things, but things that are private, I always felt are sacred and special, in part because they are private. So this was something of an adjustment for me. At a screening earlier this week, for the documentary, Lopez said that her husband was a quote, reluctant participant in the whole thing. According to People, she told the audience during a Q&A session, the other scary part was that I was bringing into it my husband, who was kind of the reluctant participant and a silent participant and all. Affleck still admits his hesitancy with having the spotlight on their relationship. It's the first time that she's done something as an artistic form of expression that was purely for the sake of what she had to express. It was about bringing out the things she felt inside that she just wanted to say, Affleck said. And I don't really love being in the making of a documentary about my personal life. Which is why I'm so relieved that it's not really and it seems like I might be in this, but not really. I was worrying for no reason. The movie wasn't about me, it was about the ability to love yourself. And that love story is a lot effing harder to find than Prince Charming. Celebrity matchmaker Alessandra Conti notes that there's been a shift in how the public engages with famous couples. Navigating the complexities of fame and having a very public relationship was challenging back in the early 2000s, but now it has reached a different level. Every couple who is remotely in the public eye experiences an intense level of scrutiny, especially with the dawn of social media, she told Fox News. However, JLo and Ben have kept a relatively low profile when it comes to social media, and although they're supporting each other at professional events, they have kept the intimate details of their relationship private. This is a smart strategy, and as long as their privacy is maintained, it is a sustainable situation for him and JLo. Ben also needs to understand that whoever he dates, he will be scrutinized in the public eye. This is one of the trade of fame, she says. In the documentary, the couple admitted they quote, just crumbled under the pressure of being a tabloid phenomenon and it put a strain on their relationship, leading them to call off their 2003 wedding three days before it was supposed to happen. I had a very firm sense of boundaries initially around the press. Well, Jen, I don't think objected to it the way I did. I very much did object to it, Affleck said. And getting back together, I said, listen, one of the things I don't want is a relationship on social media. And then I realized it's not a fair thing to ask. It's sort of like if you're gonna marry a boat captain, you want to like the water. We're just two people with kind of different approaches trying to learn to compromise. JLo is no stranger to headlines and tabloid drama though. Let's go down memory lane and rehash some of JLo's most shocking controversies. In 2020, Shakira and JLo co-headlined the Super Bowl halftime show and she was accused of throwing some serious shade at Shakira. Lopez was seen getting into a heated debate with an NFL producer about her idea to have caged child performers on stage, a reference to the living conditions that youngsters face at border detention centers. She said, I'm trying to give you something with substance, not just us out there shaking our effing butts and effing belly dancing. I want something real. I want something that's gonna make a statement, that's gonna say that we belong here and we have something to offer. 
her. The use of the term belly dancing, something which Shakira is very famous for, left many believing that she was dismissing her co-star's contributions. Jennifer Lopez was also accused of being insensitive to her husband's addiction issues in 2023 when she launched her own brand of alcoholic cocktails. The Let's Get Loud singer put her famous name to Delola, a range of drinks created with mixologist Lynette Marrero. But having only just walked down the aisle with Ben Affleck, a recovering alcoholic, this latest business venture left a sour taste for some fans. There's also a rumor that JLo didn't used to sing on her old records. Rumors had been circulating for years that Jennifer Lopez had more than a little vocal help on hits such as Play, Ain't It Funny, and I'm Real. And in 2014, fellow R&B star Ashanti appeared to confirm that these tracks were essentially uncredited duets. Jenny from the Block is another Lopez banger whose chorus you may struggle to hear the lead artist on. In 2019, Natasha Ramos said, J-Lo did indeed go in the studio and lay down background vocals over my voice. So I wouldn't say that she's so much lip syncing. However, the backgrounds are predominantly me, some ad libs, and laughs as well. Luckily, Ramos doesn't hold a grudge against the Hollywood star, but does against her label for failing to give her proper credit. Last year on TikTok, there was a viral trend going around, fans exposing J-Lo horror stories, and some of these are shocking. One woman described the experience of helping J-Lo at Foot Locker. She said Lopez, quote, cussed me out because the store didn't have the correct size for the shoes she wanted to buy her twins. But that was nothing compared to the story another woman had after Lopez came to stay in a house where she used to work as a maid. She described how a nail artist was called in to give Lopez a pedicure in bed, which the nail tech had to do upside down because Lopez, who was laying on her stomach, refused to roll over onto her back. And if you're thinking of making eye contact with JLo, never do it. A TikToker who says that her father worked as a driver for a car company, often used by JLo, said that even a driver glancing in the rear view mirror sparked Lopez to berate him for invading her privacy. Unsurprisingly, her father eventually refused to drive Jennifer ever again. JLo's new Amazon Prime movies aren't getting the best hype as some say it is the worst movie ever made. One reviewer made a list called the reasons why this sucked. I had no idea what was going on in the movie, she says. There was no theme, actually. There were too many themes. There were so many talented artists in the movie who were used more as props. They should have had a bigger role. She goes on to say, this movie seems like an ode to herself for nailing down a man, Ben Affleck. It's not really about love. This is a movie about conquering a man. She's basically telling everybody that the other relationships that her and Ben had were just filler until they could be together again. Her kids and Ben kids are going to be watching this. Do they really need to know how much she loves sleeping with their dad? We all know it's not her voice singing those songs and that she continues by saying, and if it is, auto-tune should get a lot of the credit. She is narcissistic, over the top, and way too in love with herself. For people clicking more than two stars, did you actually watch it or are you just clicking on five stars because you love this ego maniac? Yikes. All right, back to Ben and Jennifer. More inside details of their private life were released in her accompanying documentary that was just released this past week. Early in the documentary, Lopez reveals that she showed her musical collaborators a collection of letters that Affleck gave to her as a gift. This book is a book that Ben gave me on our first Christmas back together. It's every letter and email that we wrote to each other from 20 years ago and today, she says. The cover of the thick binder says, handwritten, the greatest love story never told by Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck, 2001 to 2022 and counting. Jennifer explains, it became like our Bible and we just left it there in the studio. Ben Affleck, however, was surprised their correspondences were made public. I was like, you've been showing all the musicians all these letters? And they were like, yeah, we call you Pen Affleck, he recalls in the documentary. I did really find the beauty and the poetry and the irony in the fact that it's the greatest love story never told, and if you're making a record about it, that seems kind of like you're telling it. He adds later that he had to adjust to the change. But things that are private, I've always felt are sacred and special because they're private. So this was something of an adjustment for me. At number 10, we have seven limousines. Starting off strong with her gigantic and expensive entourage to walk three city blocks. 
Apparently, she was staying at the Metropolitan when she decided to walk to the Dorchester restaurant, which was three blocks away. Instead of having her personalized bodyguards or a small group of people to keep her safe, she insisted she hire seven limos so she could travel the 200 yards from point A to point B without being bothered. Afterwards, she claimed that exercise and working out is something that makes her the happiest in life. Like walking 200 yards with a full entourage is truly exercising. The entire situation is so bizarre and out of touch, you can't help but recognize it as diva behavior. At number nine, we have how she got someone fired for asking for an autograph. A hotel maid asked her for an autograph, which is totally respectable because she's literally Jennifer Lopez. But it was how she responded that made her such a diva. When the maid asked her very politely for an autograph, nothing came of it. But a day later, the maid received a phone call from the cleaning company she was employed with to let her know that Jen complained about it and she was fired from that point on. What makes the situation worse is that the hotel tried to deny it happening to maintain its image. Not only is it shady, but the maid risked it all for little reward. Who would think that Jenny from the block would be such a princess about a fan? At number eight, we have the diamond encrusted headphones. It makes sense to have sound canceling headphones with you, especially when you have sensitive ears. But when they're entirely diamond encrusted and worth almost $6,000, it's too much. One of the more infamous moments she wore the headphones was when she was showing up to the World Music Awards on her personal speedboat. And it wasn't just personalized to her, it was completely custom made with custom love seats that were faux leather and champagne coolers. But because the boat on the water was just too loud, she had the noise canceling headphones. And like I mentioned before, they were entirely diamond encrusted. Like regular headphones just weren't enough. At number seven, we have how she won't respond to her flight attendant. She has her own private jet with her own personal flight attendants, and she wouldn't even make conversation with them. It was in 2012 when she was in hot water for it because one of her flight attendants came forward saying that she was ghosting her. The attendant in question came up to her and a few of her guests and asked if she wanted anything to drink. Jen looked at her, turned her head away from her, and told her personal assistant to tell the attendant that she would like a Diet Coke with a lime. Obviously, this is jaw-dropping behavior for anyone, even if it is on par for Jen. At number six, we have $20 million to be a judge. While she was one of the hosts on American Idol, she was charging $20 million a season. And to add to it, she even bought out Simon Cowell for $12 million so she could replace him. And to prove how much of a diva she really is, her appearance alone rejuvenated the show, so they were willing to cough up the big bucks just to keep her. She wouldn't just judge people on their talent though, she would often judge people on how they smelled. But according to her, at least she didn't judge people on how they looked. Like that's any better. At number five, we have how the construction crew was not allowed to make eye contact with her. It makes sense when one person's staring too aggressively or with weird intentions, but when it's a huge group of people, it's a little excessive, even for diva behavior. She'd hired a crew to refurbish her mansion home, and if she was around them, they were not allowed to make eye contact with her, and they weren't allowed to speak to her at all either. But that's not all. A lot of her previous helpers said the same thing, like her drivers and other caretakers. She actually ended up selling that home for $27 million and bought a new one the same year for $40 million. At number four, we have how she wouldn't shoot a commercial where she grew up. We know from her song, Jenny from the Block, that she grew up rough, and she makes it a point to share her story of triumph and overcoming the odds. But when she refused to film in the Bronx, people were taken aback. She makes it a point to seem like she still has strong connections to her roots there, but refuses to film there. It could definitely be for her own safety, but if she was so deeply connected, you would think she'd want to go back. She was actually filming a Fiat commercial and they wanted to tap into that part of her, but she would only film in LA and they required a body double to film the scenes that were in the Bronx. I suppose no matter how deep your roots go, fame overcomes that. At number three, we have her very specific food demands. We know that the diva makes very specific demands and that doesn't stop when it comes to food or drink. 
When she was touring back in 2010, she required a completely white room with top to bottom furniture and everything all in white. She also required no catering in the actual room aside from the drinks, which included, but were not limited to, room temperature refrigerated Gatorade, Coca-Cola regular and diet, a lemon wedge with smart water specifically, fruit punch, and plain M&Ms. If they weren't plain, she'd freak out. Also, if she was going to receive a piece of apple pie, it had to be a la mode, or else she'd flip her lid as well. As if it wasn't hard enough to keep her happy, any food catering was to be left outside the door by the person bringing it. Another insane food demand occurs is that when she orders breakfast at a hotel, it needs to be piping hot no matter when she arrives or when it arrives to her room. And if it's not, she'll throw a fit. But it's not just a regular order either. It's scrambled eggs, bacon, pancakes, and the rest of the nine yards. At number two, we have her specific relationship requests. If you wanna be with her, you've gotta jump through hoops to prove you're worth the position. When she was still with Alex Rodriguez, she claimed she really loved his physique, but if he ever lost it or let himself go, she wouldn't be able to stay with him because that was a deal breaker and she wouldn't marry him if it wasn't a guarantee that he would remain his shape. And that's not all. She also said that if they were going to be together, he was banned from speaking to any woman under the age of 40 in case he tried to get any ideas. She was 49 at that time, and him having a conversation with someone younger than her made her jealous and uncomfortable. And last but not least at number one, we have how she claims she isn't a diva. You know you've become fully out of touch when you do everything on this list and still claim you aren't a diva. She says she doesn't deserve the title of being a diva because she doesn't feel like she is, which makes next to no sense. But her support for that claim is that she worked very hard to get where she is and that she's still a hardworking person because a hardworking person absolutely can't be a diva with her private jet and her seven limos and her diamond encrusted headphones. Getting somewhere big in life when you come from nothing is a big deal and it's really inspiring to young and upcoming artists. But when you've become that desensitized to your lavish lifestyle, maybe it's time to do some proper soul searching. Coming in at number 10 today, we have the Grammys argument. Seems like one TikToker is shutting down all the speculation that Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez seem to be upset with each other at the Grammys, probably to gain clout for her page, but whatever works, works. As she went on to share her experience as a seat filler at the Sunday show, where she sat in a temporary vacant seat next to the stars. While a video shows the couple having a little argument at the table, the TikToker would then say that there was more to the story as to why Ben was looking a little gloomy at the event. When the TikToker explained the situation, she would say, JLo was showing Ben Affleck her phone when she was like, oh my God, honey, Look at this meme circulating about you. And apparently Ben was like, oh God, this again. Other than that moment, apparently the couple was actually really lovey-dovey throughout the show and that it never made her think that the couple was headed towards a divorce. However, in the video where it showed Jennifer looking at Ben telling him to stop, look more friendly, look motivated, prove otherwise. And it has us all wondering what he may have whispered in her ear that made her snap. And we really need to interview everyone around them to get to the bottom of this question. Number nine. Schedules and family. Trouble is already brewing in JLo's and Ben Affleck's relationship, and their hectic schedules could be the reason behind it, as it has forced them to spend a huge chunk of time apart. An inside source has lifted the lid on the couple's whirlwind romance, which has caused them to claim that the sudden change of Ben and Jennifer being miles apart has taken a toll on their relationship. Even before the two got married, just weeks leading up to the wedding, as both of their children started to feel unsettled. But the real factor that caused the tension between the two stars is their hectic schedules. With both having pretty successful careers, it has forced them to spend a huge chunk of their time apart, which has left Jennifer in tears at times as she misses Ben so much. The couple has also had to deal with the stress that comes with merging two families together. And now that the stress has started to form tensions between them. And while the world has been delighted at the fact that they got back together after almost two decades, their hectic schedules and family could lead to the ultimate breakup Hollywood has ever seen. Hey my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe.
subscribe to that channel. Number eight, motorcycle collection. Post honeymoon, things are quickly beginning to turn sour between Ben and Jennifer as the newlyweds have been at odds and have been fighting nonstop over everything from Ben's bad habit to his clothing choices. However, back in October, Radar Online would learn that JLo even took a jab at her husband when she decided to get rid of Ben's beloved motorcycle collection. An inside source would then reveal to the media outlet that JLo even had Ben's most prized motorbike collection cleared out while they were away without even telling him as she thought it would be unsafe to do so. So she decided to completely blindside Ben on the matter. After Ben found out about the matter, he and JLo got into a pretty epic fight, which caused JLo to yell at him and she even pointed her finger, which caused the insider to tell the outlet, makes people wonder if she mistakes him for a dog. Number seven, not wearing a wedding ring? Back in January, according to rumors that were making headlines on social networks, they would claim that Ben no longer wears the engagement ring he has with Jennifer Lopez, which would leave fans to question if the pair was headed towards a divorce sometime soon. And to intensify these rumors even more, the actor would soon be shown hiding his left hand from the paparazzi while he was captured walking in the city of Los Angeles with a nice coffee wearing a blue puffer jacket. Not to mention the actor could also be seen rocking a depressed look as he wore glasses and hid his hand in his pocket. This would then start to generate all kinds of comments on social media networks since the couple celebrated not one, but two weddings to celebrate their union. And now they are already making headlines as inside sources claim things aren't going so well between them. But being caught without your wedding ring isn't exactly a good look. Number six, getting sober. Back in January, a video would start to go viral on TikTok after it showed Ben Affleck talking about his addiction with alcohol in the past while he went on to protest to Jennifer that he hasn't been drinking when they attended a party. In the clip, it would show Ben and Jennifer attending an after party for the Hollywood premiere of JLo's new movie, Shotgun Wedding, on January 18th. As Jennifer's hit track, Let's Get Loud, is heard playing in the background, Jennifer is seen holding a wine glass as Ben yells over the music, I didn't drink anything, okay? Jennifer is then seen lifting the glass while maintaining eye contact with Ben as she cautiously takes a drink before placing it down as her husband shouts at Jen. As the video has started to go viral, it has sparked a major debate among users and a number of users would slam Jennifer as they suggested that she was being unsupportive to Affleck by drinking while others claimed that she was just testing the drink to see if there actually was anything in it as she was worried. Ben is falling back into his old alcohol addiction habits and she's scared he might enter into a rehab program again soon. Number five, the past. Today it seems like the world can't stop talking about Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck's reunion, but it seems like the pair's past might be coming back to haunt them as neither can trust each other due to their long history. When the pair first broke up after it was hinted Ben had some major chemistry with his on-screen partner, Jennifer Garner, Ben would later call off his engagement with Lopez and Mary Garner. And in some interviews, it would prove that Ben causes more harm to the woman around him as he likes to later gush about them to the press and he often talks about how much he regrets causing them harm until everyone forgets how awful he truly was to them. As JLo claimed that the two broke up because of having a public relationship, it was really hard on them. She would also refer to the relationship as self-destructive and that Ben crushed her soul when he pulled out of the wedding that she took so much time to plan just to hit rock bottom when she she found out he got garnered just shortly after. Not to mention, Ben even chirped her to the press after he told the press that he blamed all his troubles on JLo and that Garner saved him. But now the tables have turned. It makes you wonder what part of their past still haunts them. Number four, bad habits. While Jennifer always tries to understand and support Ben through all of his problems, when she asks Ben to support and understand her, the actor simply just acts indifferent and only focuses on his feelings without caring about what his wife feels. Jennifer as a result has been left feeling a little sad because she fears that Ben might even fall back into his same old patterns. Ben who has already gone to rehab several times due to various vices has overcome a lot but now he is smoking heavily and this is apparently a situation that Jennifer is not really pleased with. It's gotten to the point where she's even had to talk to Ben's team where she has urged them not to give him any more cigarettes but he has ignored his team and his wife on the matter and he's 
even been caught out in public sneaking in some smoke time, which has caused JLo to be on edge. And she is now at the point she is losing hope on Ben fixing his bad habits, and that this could be one of the reasons she files for divorce shortly. Number three, too hopeful. You know when they say if something is meant to be, it will come back to you? Well, that's exactly what happened to Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. And while the couple seems to be true believers when it comes to that statement, they seem to be a little too hopeful when it comes to the relationship this time around. When the two first got back together, they saw the spark they knew they both had still, and they dove quickly back into their relationship. 17 years after, they went their separate ways and called off their engagement in 2004. And since they have gotten remarried, they spend a lot of their time talking about what went wrong in their past, which is hashtag a giant red flag. While both are really hopeful that their relationship this time around will last as they want to spend more time putting in effort and that they believe that they are both more mature and are on the same page, it just seems like they are too invested in each other's lives and they're focusing on all the problems instead of all the good that can come with this relationship. Number two, the long honeymoon phase. All good things can't last forever and it seems like JLo and Ben have finally reached the end of their extremely long honeymoon phase, which lasted longer than any other honeymoon phase. While he was caught whispering something into his wife's ear right before, JLo could be seen jerking away and snapping at him after a lip reader confirmed Jennifer said, stop, look more friendly, look motivated. Ben then responded by saying, I might. However, just before their public spat, they were in a six month honeymoon phase that just looked too unrealistic because no one is that gooey and love and happy. And if you are, something is lying deep within and you're hiding it and that's the scary part. It's like dating someone you know at the beginning and how they're like really nice and you know something's up and then six months later, they're a completely different person. And coming in at number one today, we have the gloomy reactions. Ever since Ben got with JLo, he's been looking pretty gloomy and every time he's caught out in public looking a little upset, he starts to go viral as his fans try to figure out what might be making Ben seem sad. You would think after dating Jenny on the block, you would be pretty upbeat, but just days after tying the knot, Ben was seen with JLo looking pretty angry, like someone had stolen his lunch money or even asked him to physically growl out loud. But since the emergence of sad Affleck started to go viral last January, the meme hasn't shown signs of slowing down and it's clear something concerning is going on with the star. According to Danny Minogue, it was, for her, it was JLo's insane ultimatums. And she's not alone in that. Some of the reports about Lopez's most egregious sounding on set demands and ultimatums aren't just from projects she stars in, but also even when she's appearing on a show just for a single day. According to a report her B for her BBC interview, Lopez required enough dressing rooms for a 90 person entourage if she was going to show up on the day of. In 2022, Danny Minogue shared what JLo was like on their shared episode of Top of the Pops. Minogue and Lopez were set to feature during the same filming, but Lopez at the last second threatened not to show. And according to Minogue, it was unless her backstage room was redecorated. I was told everything had to be white, including the sofa. All I could think is girlfriend is cover head to toe in body makeup. How do you sit on an all white couch? Meanwhile, when she's the star of the show, the show is quite literally revolving around her power tripping schedule. According to an insider who spoke to Now Magazine in 2011, Lopez demanded to eat at exact times every day, no matter what was happening. If the natural lighting was just right, if everything was set up perfectly, Lopez would still walk off set at 10.15 on the dot to eat food specially made for her. This source was from the set of What to Expect When You're Expecting, a movie that J.Lo filmed with Cameron Diaz, and the two famously didn't get along following our next worst J.Lo moment, the movie line interview, which went down in history, man. In an era of interviews PR managed within an inch of their lives, it's rare for a major star to shred into another, let alone half a dozen. But times were different in 1998, and while speaking the movie line, Jennifer Lopez appeared on a mission to burn bridges with every female actor of her generation. When asking Lopez why she believed she was even popular in Hollywood at the time, her answer was simply, because I'm the best. During that interview, described as an orchestrated and deliberate scene, JLo's lounging by her swimming pool mid-massage as she proceeds to say that Cameron Diaz was a lucky model who had given a lot of opportunities I just wish she would have done more with. That she didn't know any work Gwen Paltrow did and that she was famous by association to Brad Pitt. Oh, she also said she wasn't a fan of Winona Ryder. And even S shamed Salma Hayek and bravely slated another multi-talent Madonna by saying, do I think she's a great actress? No, acting is what I do. So I'm harder on people when they say, oh, I can that, I can act. I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. Your craft, JLo? Bit of a stretch for someone who bit the hand who fed her. And I'm of course talking about her relationship with Rosie Perez because JLo wouldn't have a career without her, yet bashes her. Perez was the choreographer 
at an open casting call for In Living Color in 1991. While the show's creator called J Lo a chubby and corny looking girl during audition, Rosie saw potential in dancing, was adamant they gave J Lo a chance. But in her autobiography, Perez recalled that soon, quote, all of the girls are coming into my office, complaining how J Lo is manipulating wardrobe, manipulating makeup, and me, all to her advantage, Perez wrote. Adding in that when she confronts Lopez about this, she reacted like, quote, some ghetto biatch, screaming and pounding her chest. Though Lopez left In Living Color after just two seasons, once she made it big in Hollywood, she went right on a smear campaign on Perez, making disparaging comments about the woman. I was blindsided, Perez said. I thought we were cool. I called her up and she wouldn't pick up. And then the next time the pair run into each other, JLo pretends nothing ever happened. Nothing new. JLo likes to pretend a lot of things, like that her career wasn't built off of theft. It starts, of course, with Sony chairman Tommy Mottola and his contentious divorce from Mariah Carey. The newly Sony side JLo was young and pretty and very desperate. So, ugh. Tommy chose to use her as his pawn to try and sabotage Mariah's glitter soundtrack. And he did so by giving JLo the same samples and beats he saw Mariah using. Mariah's single still comes out on top, but Matola did, however, find success in damaging Mariah's career. And JLo and her team learned that her success laid in using the work of other artists. She especially profited off of black underground artists, either by literally using their vocals or by taking and rewriting their songs with differing lyrics. Said artists were those like Shante Moore, Christina Millian, Usher, Mariah Carey, and of course Ashante, who wrote Ain't It Funny, and Natasha Ramos, who wrote Jenny from the Block. Both artists' backgrounds, ad libs, laughs, and main vocals were used in the songs, but uncredited. JLo's theft of music became so persistent and even repetitive for some artists that many began leaking their own music so JLo wouldn't steal it. And Usher was the first, but definitely not the last, to loudly sue the singer and win for it. But just like JLo, since the block was mentioned, I'm now going to bring it up and tell numerous stories about it. This first one, uh, how Jenny caused a fiasco. So Lopez once starred in a Fiat commercial in which she drove around the Bronx and explained why her old neighborhood continues to inspire her. Her deal with the Italian manufacturer was reportedly worth millions, yet she refused to actually return to the block that she sang about and forced Fiat to find a body double to do so. The owner of Mott Haven Barbershop, seen in the ad, said the commercial featuring the Fiat 500 car drove up and down the street of East 136, but Lopez was not at the wheel. Instead, it was a double that looked like her. JLo's people refused to comment on it, but Fiat was forced to, and they make a public statement explaining that the body double was because of scheduling decisions. I guess I can't be too surprised given that JLo even went so as far to refuse financial aid to her own old high school and community. Jenny from the Block has donated, rather stingily and minimally over the years, to charity, but never to her own suffering neighborhood, which has now been criticized by her former principal, Claire Latampa, from the Holy Family School, for allegedly turning her back on the community. Latampa, who worked alongside the star's own mother, Lupe, at the school, tells the New York Daily News, Jennifer hasn't even sent us a CD. Her mother, Lupe, was wonderful. A sweetie. Wonderful with the kids. When Jennifer became famous, I asked Lupe if Jennifer could donate a scholarship in her name, and Lupe said, uh-uh, that's her money and that's it. The school board has since sent inquiries to the singer in the past, asking for potential scholarships be set up in her name for prominent music or dance students, but they've received no response. And Latempa adds that the recession hit parents hard. Many of them are single mothers. A lot have lost their jobs. And she said, I have one mother who worked at St. Vincent's Hospital for 25 years who's out of work. It's a hard time for families to make tuition. I keep praying she'll donate. It's hard to imagine JLo will donate anything though when she did something like the casino reclaim. Several TikTok users have accused Lopez of not tipping her wait staff, but two stories in particular take the cake, or in this case, the tip. So TikTok user uh, Penny claims that her friend, once employed at the Las Vegas Tavern, told her about serving Ben Affleck one night and he gave said friend a 10K tip for the service. But once JLo caught wind of the tip money, she allegedly took it back. Apparently, Affleck was so mortified that the next day he sent a bouquet and $25,000 tip to the server. In a second TikTok now deleted, a woman corroborates this story, claiming the couple's notoriously anti-tipping. Lopez tells Affleck not to tip. He doesn't tip anymore though, baby. You don't need to tell him nothing. He ain't doing it. Taking back tips is some next level behavior from a millionaire like JLo, but the woman also cares so little about livelihood of others, she makes her staff jump through hoops. So, a flight attendant told Star Magazine how JLo refused to even acknowledge him after he asked to take her drink order. Instead, she turned her head away and told 
told her personal assistant, please tell him I'd like a Diet Coke and a lime. And in 2022, amid TikTok storm of fans sharing negative encounters with Lopez, one user, Kayla, shared how her father worked for a driving company, but he refused to drive for JLo after learning her rules. Drivers can't look at her or talk to her. They can't let her luggage touch the ground, and if they even glance through the rear view mirror at her, they could be subjected to a scolding. This is believable since a woman on Quora, Emily Watford, shared her experience working in a concert arena and watching a doorman get fired for making eye contact with JLo. And there is rumors of a construction crew from her house who were all banned from eye contact as well. It's absolutely insane to me though how stingy JLo is given how much money she makes, but even worse is she has incredibly low standards for earning it as well. Like performing for dictators? According to the Human Rights Watch, Turkmenistan is one of the world's most repressive countries. So it was little surprise that JLo is heavily criticized when she agreed to perform for its president's 56th birthday celebrations in 2013. This man's a tyrant responsible for breaching countless human rights laws. And she declared, it was our pleasure towards the end of her set. And we wish you the very happiest of birthdays. Lopez representatives pleaded ignorance following the public backlash. One claiming in a statement that the A-lister would have turned down the invitation if she'd been aware of the president's past, as if she doesn't have access to Google. It would have been a viable excuse also if JLo hadn't already done similarly before. She took to the stage for an Ozzy oligarch and then a Uzbek businessman's wedding for a million dollar sum. And ahead of two controversial gigs in Russia, she reportedly told fans, I don't like to talk politics to be quite honest. But she seems really okay dropping political words. You know, like when JLo thought everyone would let her get away with dropping a slur in her 2001 remix of I'm Real. Not only did the song have zero similarity to the original whatsoever, but the Latina singer bravely drops the n-word in the opening verse. Penned by Jerul, who also rapped on the record and its producer Irv Gotti, the track quickly came under fire from Hot 97, Star and Buckwild, The Morning Radio, DJs implored listeners to voice their disapproval of the song, and even planned to throw rice and beans at Lopez when she took to the Rockefeller Center's outdoor plaza stage for the Today Show. Edward Hawkins told the Washington Post at the event, the singer still needs to make amends, stating when your music is geared towards suburbanites, there's a certain way you should carry yourself. Using a word like that when less of a third of her audience is African American or Latino is inappropriate. Lopez, however, never apologized for the stunt, instead insisting in a quote for anyone to think or suggest or say that I'm racist is really absurd and hurtful to me. A statement which very obviously doesn't actually even address her usage of the word at all, let alone the true reason that people were criticizing her. 